get started. Hi, everyone. Jason Lukey back here with our playlist, Talk Math to Me. Today, we're going to begin exploring the importance of this course in the math classroom. I'm super excited about this episode and what we get to cover here. I've got a special guest that will be joining me, and we'll get to explore a favorite topic of mine, teaching mathematics. So our purpose today is to uncover why we must talk in math class. For two decades now, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics has pushed teachers to use this course in the math classrooms. And why? Well, really, it boils down to two reasons. To support students' ability to, one, reason mathematically, and two, to communicate that reasoning. Well, that was simple. Nice short episode. Thanks, everybody. Boy, I thought that was going to be a lot harder. Just kidding. Seriously, though, if this is our goal, and it is a really noble goal for math teachers, then we must be intentional about this course in our math classroom. And as I know well from experience, this course in a math class can be really difficult. You know, it's not our traditional approach to math instruction. For years, most of us have been teaching math from a teacher-centered perspective. But we're gonna get to the more practical side of things later. So as we will throughout our playlist here on Math Talk, I'd like to bring in an expert on math instruction and math discourse. Today's guest is Trisha Timmel. Well, Trisha, thanks for joining us today. So happy to have you with us. If you would, Trisha, just take a second to introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about your background. Great. Well, thanks, Jason. I'm glad to be joining you. So it's interesting. When I introduce myself, my first thing that I still say is I'm one of 11 children, which is funny because I have grandchildren. So I'm still identifying my place in the world from my family order. But I think it really influenced my work as an educator, having been from this large family. So my family is probably about as varied as it comes from experiences and viewpoints. And I'm number eight in, in the pack. So I'm kind of a middle child, but I'm also kind of the oldest of the bottom three. And I think it really influenced me as a teacher. So I really, um, I kind of always wanted to help that underdog student. Like that, that was my goal. Like I want everybody to be successful. So I, I spent 26 years in the classroom and most of them were as a middle school math teacher. And so, um, you know, that's an age where you get all kinds of kids and they're, they're wanting to, you know, establish their independence. Um, so that, that, that was really my, my niche. I have three children and they are currently 33, 32 and 31. So at the time when they were 11, 12, and 13, everything I loved about teaching middle school did not love so much as a parent. So I found it challenging to have that age group all day and then come home to it. So who suffered, of course, was my children, you know, not my students at school. So I had an opportunity to go down and teach third grade in my district. So I taught th third grade for four years and that was good. My children are all living, my husband and I are still married, and I became a better math teacher. It just really um, shaped this idea about, um, you know, ways to interact with students because when I was teaching all subject areas, I really had to think differently. So it, it transformed my teaching. Um, so from, from teaching, after those 26 years, when I first left the classroom, I worked for college preparatory mathematics. And my role there was an instructional coach for middle and high school students. And that was the first time that I read Principles to Action from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And also around that time was when I first read Carol Dweck's book on mindset. And that really, for me, affirmed a lot of things that were kind of gut feelings about teaching and that um, ways that I responded to students and the things that I said really impacted if they developed a growth or a fixed mindset. But I was just, you know, by the seat of my pants doing things. It also made me wonder about how I responded to my children. But I've let go of that guilt because they're grown adults, all working, married, paying taxes. So I didn't screw up too badly. 
Um, so fast forward then after um, doing that instructional coaching, I um, took a position with Home Life and Harcourt. And so now I've been there about six years and I'm a manager of curriculum and content. And most recently, I've really been diving into what Joe Bowler says about Twex Research and Mathematical Mindsets and Hattie's work on visible learning and really how different instructional practices impact what students learn in the classroom. Yeah. But that's a long answer to telling you a little bit about myself. Well, I think it's important. I think it's important to um, kind of hear about your experience in the classroom. And I think those big shifts in grade bands that, that you made, like that really helps you have some insight into what those development years mean to uh, uh, students' math um, or mathematical ability later on, you know? Right. Um, and that mindset piece, you know, I'm really passionate about that myself. And I think it's super important in math. Um, you mentioned you're having your own children. And um, I think you and I talked earlier about um, with my own kids, they they almost don't like it that I'm a math person because I force them to think about math and talk about math. Um, I think it's really important to take into consideration an example from a classroom. Let's consider the commutative property of multiplication and addition. Obviously, very important concept across multiple grade levels. And at this point in our third grade example, students have already encountered the concept of six plus three equals nine is the same as three plus six equals nine. But as the teacher, you know, I could explain that multiplication is like addition and that six times three and three times six are also the same thing. I would then expect my students to believe me and we could move on and start applying that property. However, if I really want to deepen my students' understanding of that concept and help them apply it down the road, then we need to begin having a conversation. And we need to ask our students to explore the issue to get to that deeper level of understanding. And that's what math discourse is all about. This is why tasks in our math classroom have the capacity to spark learning. Students have to explore and experience that productive struggle in order to develop mathematically and ultimately develop into mathematicians. Let's explore that concept a little bit more with Trisha. Tell me a little bit more about, um, about the research around math discourse. You can. Okay. So um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall back to the experts. So, Hattie has done a lot of research about instructional practices. So what Hattie and his team did was they, they looked at different teaching practices and they, they gave them an effect size. Because um, what we know is it's twofold. Implementing effective practices is just as important as eliminating ineffective practices. Let's that sink in. So, this, this hinge point of 0 0.4, so if, if, I, if we have an effect size of 0 0.4, that is a year's worth of growth in a school year. So you can see anything to the right of that, anytime we have a score of higher than 0.4, we want to really embrace that teaching practice. And on, on the flip side of that, if we have some practices that are lower than 0.4, we want to pause and think about those. For instance, teaching test-taking skills has an effect size of 0.27. Well, is that is that really influencing or helping students to grow that school year? It, it, like we feel like that's a good practice and it's a practice we've done all the time, but it's really that effect size would say maybe not. So um, in Patty's research, classroom discussion slash classroom discourse has an effect size of 0.82. So if we just let that sink in, we want kids talking in math. And then there is an entire chapter, chapter seven in this book, Visible Learning for Mathematics, looks specifically at the kinds of feedback we as teachers give students. And so when we give feedback to adjust student learning, it has an effect size of 0.75.
So to do that, that means I need to be listening, right? So we talked about that, how important that is. So um, to be effective like that, it needs to direct attention to what's next. And it needs to be just in time, just for me, information for those students. So if you haven't taken some time to, to think about Hattie's research, I really encourage you to do so because it really has a huge impact on student gains. And, and that's really what we're all about, right? We want those students to be understanding and growing mathematically and feeling good about themselves as mathematicians. Well, and I think um, I think you're right. That's really important to be thinking about the research that's out there. And Hattie is a is a great place to get to get that research and to be thinking about what strategies work and which ones aren't as effective. And I think it's what you said there at the beginning of that about there are some strategies that maybe we need to to stop using or take another look at because they're not as effective as we thought they were. You know. Um, so often in, in education, you've been in education for a long time, so. You can identify with all of our teachers out there that that um, we learn something new and it doesn't necessarily fit on our plate, right? And so then it's like, we have to think of something that we can take off of our plate, right? And so when we're thinking about math discourse, if this is something that we're, um, that we're not using right now and it's something that we wanna start using, maybe we need to be thinking about a strategy we can take off of our plate, right? If we rely on traditional keyword instruction. For example, order doesn't matter in multiplication. We're not allowing our students for productive struggle. And we're not developing deep thinking mathematicians. Let's just take a moment to talk about tasks and productive struggle. What kind of task will lead to that productive struggle? Those are the low floor and high ceiling tasks, meaning that my students, all of them, have an entry point to the problem, that's the low floor, so that my struggling students, my struggling mathematicians, can get into the problem. And then the high ceiling, that's so that my advanced thinkers have some room for that same productive struggle. And since we want our students to struggle in order to exercise their math brains, we will be there guiding them with questions or talk moves. And that's it right there. The special sauce, if you will. In order to develop our students into better mathematicians, we must engage them in that productive struggle through the use of low floor, high ceiling tasks and talk strategies. Remember what Trisha said today. Classroom discussion slash classroom discourse has an effect size of 0.82. And the influence that we have when we use discourse in the classroom, you know, that ultimate goal that we talked about with NCTM of supporting students' ability to reason mathematically and to communicate that reasoning, that's the reason that we must talk in the math classroom. It's an effective strategy. We know that it works. And we know that things that work are the things that we should use in our classroom because that's where we'll see the exceptional growth with our students. Guys, stay tuned for our future episodes in our Talk Math To Me series. I don't know about you, I can't wait to engage in conversations with my mathematicians. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the HMH International Content Cares YouTube channel. If you're looking for more content, click on the video to the right of your screen. Welcome to our global community.